In late 2013, a software engineer named Jackson Palmer, who was working at Adobe at the time, decided to lampoon the burgeoning digital currency market that was dominated by Bitcoin and increasingly flooded with other similar-ish offerings, often called altcoins. Among them, such standouts as Worldcoin, Anoncoin, Megacoin, and BBQ Coin. And he did this by creating a splash page for a not real digital asset of his own, which he jokingly called Dogecoin. The name of this faux coin was derived from a meme that featured a Shiba Inu dog, Comic Sans typography, and a specific type of misspelling that became associated with the meme. Phrases like much wow and so amaze allude to the idea that this text represents the internal monologue of this dog that is looking at the camera awkwardly, which I know doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you've never seen this meme. But the upside is that the fake altcoin this software engineer advertised on this fake landing page featured the face of this much-beloved meme-worthy Shiba Inu dog. And the name Doge, which is what the dog became known as due to the aforementioned misspellings that accompany these memes, became part of the fake altcoins moniker, Dogecoin. Another software engineer named Billy Marcus, who was working for IBM at the time, saw the splash page for this fake altcoin, loved the concept, and reached out to Palmer to see if he was keen to make this joke coin into an actual digital asset. One that could be designed so that it reached a much wider audience than Bitcoin, despite having many of these same attributes. Marcus had already been working on a digital coin that at the time he called Bells, named after an in-game currency from Nintendo's Animal Crossing video game. The Bells concept wasn't really getting much traction, though, and he thought it would be funny to repurpose that same coin as Dogecoin to see if it would do any better. There's not much that distinguishes Dogecoin as a digital currency from its other altcoin competitors. It is essentially a clone of an open-source peer-to-peer software project called Litecoin, which was released a few years earlier. The Doge angle of this new coin, though, set it apart and allowed it to play a role that other coins had not been able to play at this point in history. It was popular. It was friendly. And it was something that you could talk about without worrying that bystanders would think that you were doing something shady or illegal. In those early days of Dogecoin, Bitcoin was still, to most people, an asset that you only really bought into if you were either super into tech or dealing in some kind of illegal product, like drugs or hired assassinations. It was strongly associated with what's often called the dark web, and that meant marketing such coins, especially to a more mainstream audience, was tricky. It was difficult to convince anyone of the value of these things, but even trickier in some ways, to convince them that they could be valuable for something other than serving as a coinage for criminals. Dogecoin got gobs of press, though, and it was mostly positive and enthusiastic, and Dogecoin seemed to operate in a different space from every other digital asset at the time, as evidenced by several dips in the prices of these coins in 2013 and 2014, most of which saw the prices of Bitcoin and other such assets collapse, while Dogecoin either remained steady or increased in value over the same period. In 2015, Palmer announced that he would be taking a leave of absence from the world of cryptocurrencies, calling the space toxic and stagnant. And in 2018, he penned a piece for Vice entitled, My Joke Cryptocurrency Hit $2 Billion and Something is Very Wrong, in which he expounded upon this criticism, saying that the space had been overrun by conmen and grifters, that the venture capital community was being swindled and was swindling in equal measure in their cryptocurrency-related efforts, 
and that the technology behind such digital assets, which he believed had tons of promise and potential, was immensely flawed. But no one was doing anything to fix those flaws. All the energy and attention in the crypto space was focused on how to make as much money as possible as quickly as possible. He described the enthusiasm for and attention given to the world of cryptocurrencies at the time as being primarily about get-rich-quick schemes, and addressed issues ranging from the cost of electricity to mine many of these coins, to the relative ignorance of most of the new arrivals to the space, who were enthusing over the potential to make money on a technology that they didn't understand. People who would almost certainly be the ones holding the bag when the music stopped and those riling them up and filling them with dreams of instant riches walked away with the lion's share of the profits. As it turns out, Palmer was both right and wrong in that 2018 piece. And what I'd like to talk about today are recent events that point to another round of perhaps justified, perhaps unjustified, economic enthusiasm, the potential for more bubbles, and the likelihood that many people will lose quite a lot of money on popular asymmetric investment vehicles in the relatively near future. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a supporter. You can find a list of different ways to help support this show at letsknowthings.com support, but one of the simpler ways is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. And folks who contribute to any amount each month receive an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free and call-to-action-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show in some way, shape, or form, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled... Dumb Money is on GameStop, and it's beating Wall Street at its own game. If you were anywhere near the news, social media, or the internet in general a few weeks ago, you almost certainly heard at least something about this story, possibly only a fraction of it, and possibly through one of several framings that positioned it as a fun, goofy tale of the internet being weird, or maybe as a David wins against Goliath tale, or perhaps even as a lottery winner style story written like a puff piece about one of the people who made a fortune, essentially overnight, paid off their school debt or credit card bills or bought a house, or just had gobs of money on paper, at least for a while. This is one of those rare stories that is actually kind of true through all of those lenses, and was so widely reported upon, probably because it did serve as a nice puff piece. It had a lot of facets that could be addressed over the span of several days, which helped to fill the void in the news cycle that's been left by the previous U.S. president when he was ousted from both the White House and most of social media earlier this year. And it allowed for several rounds of you thought it was this way, but actually it's this way reporting that gave journalists and columnists the opportunity to, in some cases, correct misinterpretations of the situation made by their press world peers, and in some cases to themselves produce works that were a little less wrong with each iteration as new information rose to the surface and as new understandings of the mechanisms that underpinned this story were divulged and uncovered. The short version of what happened, as reported in this Times piece, is this. A group of mostly casual day traders who frequent a Reddit forum called Wall Street Bets, where legitimate day trading advice was shared alongside posts about far riskier trades, penny stocks that might balloon in price in the near future, for instance, and which you should absolutely buy now just in case that happens, came to the forefront. A lot of these posts, as the name of the forum implies, are about bets, not chilled out, build wealth over time style investment tips, 
so frenetic, all-caps extrapolations about why some random unheard-of company or another was a great bet was not uncommon, nor was unasked-for advice from random anonymous profiles about how to do various sorts of research and what sorts of tools you could use to track your bets and plan arbitrage opportunities over time. Several well-known denizens of this forum began posting about the potential of a company called GameStop, which was a very popular, mostly mall-based video game store that flourished in the 1990s and early 2000s in the United States, but which has been floundering for years, in part due to the decrease in foot traffic at malls around the U.S., in part because of the migration of video games, from physical discs and devices to downloads and online versions, and in part because there are so many other players in the video game sales space these days that even if they weren't focused on older, physical video game mediums, they would still be facing stiffer competition than they did in their heyday. There were arguments made in this Wall Street Bets forum about why GameStop was a good value stock style bet. Essentially, that it was being undervalued by the market, that it had some real potential by traditional stock world metrics, and that it could thus go up in price in the near future. Other arguments, though, were oriented around what's called a short squeeze opportunity, and the idea was that if this community worked together, they could all make a bunch of money, but they could also severely harm several hedge funds that were trying to make money by shorting GameStop stock. Now let's pause here for a few definitions. Reddit is a forum-focused online social network, and rather than one main forum where people post, there are sub-forums called subreddits, with themes ranging from astrology to progressive politics to, in this case, Wall Street bets. A value stock is a share of a company that is expected to succeed because the company in question is a well-run business that is expected to continue doing well according to the fundamentals over time, even if in some cases very slowly. Shorting a stock is something that you might consider doing when you think a stock's price will decrease. You pay a small amount of money, and that fee allows you to essentially borrow a share of stock today and sell it and then you return a share of the same stock back to the entity from which you borrowed it later. And this can be a great deal if that stock's price goes down in the meantime, as it means that you can borrow a share of the stock and sell it at one price, say $100, and then replace it later at a lower price if the stock's price goes down in the meantime, say to $80. If that's the case, that's $20 in your pocket, less the fees required to perform the short. So that's free money if your bet pays off. The trouble with this kind of bet is that if the price goes up instead, you are on the hook for all those shares. You have to return them by a certain date, which is set when you buy the short. And if the stock has increased in price by a lot, you are on the hook for a lot of money because you have to buy that same number of shares at that new higher price. So if you short a stock when it's $100, hoping that it will go down, but then the price goes up instead, you were able to sell that stock for $100, but then had to buy it back at $120. So you're out $20, plus the cost of the short. You have lost money, not made money. A short squeeze refers to a situation in which a stock has been shorted, so entities like hedge funds have bought a lot of shorts, profited from those shorts, and will soon need to buy shares of that shorted stock so they can return them to the entities from which they borrowed them. But because the price is going up instead of down, they are forced to either wait until the very last minute and buy them potentially at an even higher price, or to buy them sooner and cut their losses. So they'll be buying at a higher price, but perhaps not as high as it could go, which allows them to lose less than they would have otherwise. But them buying in this way, at this moment, tends to also raise the price of the stock on the market, because they are scrambling to buy a bunch of shares all at once, and that raises demand, and thus usually raises the price of that stock on the market even further. The theory, then, 
was that all these hedge funds that were already on the hook to buy a bunch of GameStop stocks at a particular point in the near future would be forced to buy a bunch more sooner at a far higher price if a whole lot of folks from this Reddit forum would gang up buy as many GameStop stocks as they could afford, and thus increase the market price in a meaningful way. In a way that would make it clear that they did not intend to let up and would only continue to push the price higher. In this way, the surge in popularity from all those Redditors pushed up the price of GameStop stocks, and then the hedge fund managers, seeing the resolve in this community, and the fact that the buying just became more rampant and enthusiastic over time, decided to buy the shares that they needed to make good on their shorts sooner, assuming that the price would just keep going up, and if they waited, they'd lose even more money. And that mass purchasing of shares to make good on all those shorts inflated the price of this stock even further because of that sudden surge in demand. This is why a stock that was worth just over $17 at the beginning of January, when early Reddit denizens started getting involved in this plan, was worth over $500 at one point later in the month. A 30x increase in price, and one that caused the most prominent and vocal hedge fund short seller of GameStop to lose 53% of their total investments. And it's estimated that, in aggregate, all short sellers of this one stock during this one period lost about $6 billion as a result of this short squeeze. Because of the sorts of people who were, publicly at least, on the side of GameStop, buying up shares of the stock and banging the drum for it on social media, and because of the sorts of people who were on the other side, talking the company down and buying shorts on the company. You can probably see where the David and Goliath angle of this story came from. On its face, at least, it would seem that a scrappy group of people from the internet banded together and took down a bunch of Wall Street bullies. The reality is a bit more complex than that, but it does make for a hell of a narrative, and one that has in the past few weeks resulted in several book deals, at least a few film options, and quite a lot of press for the involved parties including some of the journalists who covered this story. Despite the breathless coverage and obvious entertainment value of everything that has happened, though, remarkably, this whole tale took place over the course of about a week. The buildup on Reddit was happening months before the surge in buys and the inflation in the price of GameStop stock, and the repercussions are still being felt today, weeks later. But this whole bubble beginning to end only lasted about a week. For one week in total, GameStop stock traded for over $100 per share. As of the day I'm recording this, the stock is down to under 50 and seems to be trending downward, despite the efforts by many different people with many different motivations to get it surging again. In the aftermath of that bubble, there are a few well-flogged stories about folks who made out like bandits, pulling in thousands, even millions in some cases, though there are far more stories about people who invested in what they thought would be a pathway to riches, only to find that they had arrived too late. Their shares either lost value before they could sell them off, or the money is now stuck in this stock, which doesn't, as of the day I'm recording this at least, show any sign of popping back up to anything close to what they paid for it, which, if you bought in at $500 or even $100, is not good news. This flurry of excitement, what we might call irrational exuberance for a specific asset type, is a remarkably pure example of what is called an economic or speculative bubble. Speculative bubbles typically arise when some asset class, be it tulips or crypto coins or game store stocks, comes to be worth more than the underlying assets warrant. If a share of stock is $17 and then shoots up to $500, but the assets underpinning that price justifies it, maybe the company in question released an immensely popular new product, bought an important new patent, or something along those lines, that is just a popular asset experiencing an arguably justified price increase. 
If there's no change to the underlying asset, though, but the price shoots up 30,000%, that's something else entirely. That is likely to be a bubble. And although bubbles have many different scales, form around different types of assets, and have happened throughout history, one consistency is that they eventually, either quickly or very slowly, either deflate or pop. The bubble that formed around GameStop stock seems to have popped after about a week. And though it's still higher in price than it was before, there's a decent chance that the remaining price increase is the consequence of people who found themselves holding the bag for those who were able to sell their shares before the asset price plummeted. And they are either hanging on, hoping the price goes back up at some point, or uncertain of what to do, because they bought their shares at several multiples of what the stock is now worth. The greater fool theory of economics comes into play here. And this theory says, in essence, that when an asset's price is determined by popular sentiment instead of some measure of intrinsic value, so if a Beanie Baby is worth $1,000 not because that's what it costs to make and market and sell the product at a profit, but because that's what a particular version of this brand of stuffed animal will fetch on eBay, each sale of that asset requires that the current owner find someone who is a greater fool than they are so they can unload it. At some point, reality will set in and folks will run out of greater fools and everyone will realize that a Beanie Baby is just a stuffed animal and that $1,000 investment will be worth $10. So when you see these sorts of bubbles begin to form, you can be fairly certain that the canniest operators were invested in the asset before it got big and popular, and will do their best to get out right before or just after it hits its peak. They don't want to be holding on to a stockpile of Beanie Babies when the prices start to collapse, when people start to panic, and when prices plummet. They will do their best to find as many greater fools as they can before that moment arrives. In this case, the folks who riled up the Wall Street Bets forum did a laudable job getting their fellow Redditors to participate in their bubble-building exercise by portraying it as a matter of honor and justice, ostensibly supporting a nostalgia-inducing company that many of them shopped at when they were younger, and getting them behind the idea of punishing the evil Wall Street denizens who seemed to do very little but rent-seek and periodically collapse the economy at everyone else's expense. Based on reporting from after that main bubble week, it would seem that those who did this initial flogging were themselves Wall Street professionals, and they got most of their money out before the bubble started deflating, as they were still encouraging other people within these forums to hold, hold, hold. Most of the people who lost money or found themselves stuck in this asset as it deflated, in contrast, were people who bought into the ideology of it or who were sold on the concept of fast money, but arrived a bit too late. They proved to be the greater fools that those who cashed out required and assumed that they could find their own greater fools before everything collapsed, which turned out not to be the case. What's interesting about this particular bubble is that it illustrates some stock market peculiarities and difficulties that we have today that didn't exist, or at least not in their contemporary shape, during previous bubbles. Earlier periods of irrational exuberance, like the dot-com bubble of the early 2000s, saw fairly dramatic halo effects, where unbridled, arguably unjustified enthusiasm for a particular asset type, the stocks of companies that did some kind of business on the early internet, any kind of business really, fed enthusiasm for other similar asset types. A whole lot of companies from this era got money from investors because they intended to do business on the internet in some vague way, not because they had particularly good business plans or talent or anything else that justified those investments, but because internet was mentioned in their prospectus. The GameStop bubble did have a halo effect, increasing the stock prices of companies like AMC and BlackBerry and Nokia for a time. An in-person movie theater chain and a couple of older mobile phone and tech companies, respectively. And all of them surged based on the same nostalgic logic that was applied to GameStop. 
but it was also formed and supported by an ever-present online community that was able to respond to stock market happenings and new news on the subject in essentially real time. That meant that the pile-on effect, which usually inflates bubbles over the course of weeks or longer due to reportage from traditional news sources, happened much faster this time around. People could see that their friends or people that they followed on Twitter were making bank from these investments that they'd made. And those followers, those listeners, could in turn decide to hop on this perceived money train much faster than would have been possible in the early 2000s. This bubble also saw a different sort of pylon effect from influencers of all kinds. Politicians tried to milk some trading platforms' responses to this bubble for populism points, misunderstanding either intentionally or otherwise the inability of companies like Robinhood to front the money required to make so many trades on such hugely speculative bundles of stocks in such a short period of time. And they misinterpreted this, again, either unintentionally or otherwise, as a selling out of the little guy in favor of Wall Street, something that was almost certainly not the case, but which looked good in print, and favorably positioned these politicians, who came from all parts of the political spectrum, in the press that they received for these statements. It also allowed public figures like Elon Musk to tweet their support for the movement behind this bubble, before then pivoting that support to other assets. In Musk's case, the new target was Bitcoin, and the same rules seem to apply here. It's likely that because they tweeted their unbridled enthusiasm for this particular asset type, they probably had already bought a bunch of Bitcoin, and then they sat back to watch the value of those assets increase, as other people then piled on hoping to get in on this new bubble early enough to make a profit. In that latter case, this use of one's influence is remarkably similar to a type of securities fraud called pump and dump, which essentially means that you buy up an asset cheap, artificially inflate the perceived value of that asset, pumping up the price, and then you dump that asset at that higher price on people who are willing to buy in because of their perception of that higher value. This is the type of behavior seen in many films and TV shows, where the charismatic stock seller pawns shares to unwitting victims over the phone, those victims not realizing that the hot tip that they're receiving is actually part of an effort by that company that called them to unload stocks that they've already purchased on the cheap, and they're now trying to sell that pumped up, but still relatively latently valueless stock at that inflated price. That's how they make their profits. It's a standing question as to whether using one's influence, social media-based or otherwise, can get someone nabbed for this type or other similar types of securities fraud. Though most analysts who have taken a look at the specifics of this most recent bubble in the aftermath seem to think that it's distinct enough not to fit into that category and would be difficult to prove the proper intent in either case. It's also been asked whether the collaboration arguably the conspiracy that happened in public, to buy up GameStop stock by the Wall Street Bets subreddit would itself constitute some kind of securities fraud, though most experts also seem to think that this would be a stretch and would be just as unlikely to actually hold water with regulators as the cases involving celebrities and the cryptocurrencies that they are very enthused to promote to the public on social media. As of the day I'm recording this, the Wall Street Bets forum is more popular than ever. Robinhood has been raked through the coals for failing to allow maximum trading cadence during the highest points of this bubble, allowing more people to get involved faster, and Musk and other online influencers have been reinvesting themselves in crypto, the aforementioned Bitcoin, but also, more recently, Dogecoin which again began as a joke digital asset, but which has recently popped up in value, the market price jumping from one-third of a cent per coin to around eight cents per coin in the past few months alone. It is a fair bet that we'll see more and more specific regulation in this space in the near future, because the GameStop bubble and the variables leading up to and amplifying it are forces that are likely to continue emerging and are likely to cause continued 
instability, and uncertainty in the broader stock market if left unaddressed. In the meantime, though, it's probably a good idea when assessing these sorts of situations to assume that if you did not play an active role in orchestrating the creation of the bubble, no matter how early you think you're getting in and how clever you believe you're being, there is a good chance that you are one of the people being set up to be someone else's greater fool. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here, consider becoming a supporter of the show. You can find a list of ways to do that at letsknowthings.com slash support. You can also become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. Folks who contribute any amount each month receive an additional episode of the show each month and a call to action and ad-free version of the show. A huge thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show. You are the reason that I'm able to commit the time that I do to this show each week. And for that, I am truly grateful. The book that I'd like to recommend this week is actually a course from The Great Courses. I tend to think of these as audiobooks because I tend to listen to them rather than watch them, but most of them I think you're supposed to watch them, so do what you will with that information. In any case, it's a great course, and it is called The Catholic Church, A History by William Cook. I already knew a fair bit about the Catholic Church just from reading history and paying attention to that sort of thing, and from having been brought up Catholic when I was younger, I knew a bit from that. This history, though, was a very detailed exploration of several periods that are not brought up very often, a lot of the personalities involved, and not only the philosophical and cultural influence that the church had, but also the economic and geopolitical influence that the church has had throughout history. And make no mistake, it has had a very significant geopolitical and economic influence around the world, not just in Europe or a small part of what is today Italy. These concepts are very compellingly explained. The progression through the many facets of this topic make a whole lot of sense and make them more memorable. It did for me, at least. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of The Catholic Church, A History, which is one of the great courses, and it was written and hosted by William Cook. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, at brainlenses.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find my daily news newsletter at yesterdaysnewsletter.com. That newsletter also now has an associated daily two to three minute podcast, which you can find at yesterdaysnewscast.com or by searching for yesterday's newscast wherever you get your podcasts. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook, and at Colin is my name on most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.